Recording is on. All right, so today is April 4th, 2021, and it's our special mega megalasia celebration of Extinctionati meeting. So I know we have uh, quite a few topics. Um, where do we want to start? Um, well, we should start. Or just, where should we start? Just, just giving like praise for this day, and it, it's it's so auspicious and it's so important in history. That just the fact that date is the fourth of the fourth. This is the last quarter of the southernmost moon. It's the day of Ishtar, the Holy Mother, and it's yeah the Magna Mater. Um, uh, so it's, this is her day and it's, everybody's tried to bomb it and game jacket. <laughs> Christians are still at it. They can't get rid of the white rabbit. They can't get rid of, <laughs> rid of the Easter eggs. They, it's still called Ishtar and they, uh, try as they might, they try and divert the kids, tell them bullshit this and bullshit that and that the you just can't rub it out. That's the power of an arg right there. But anyway, I think, yeah, we should probably talk a bit about Sibylle and what the day is. And, and I think there's a growing theme that I think we've been investigating in that sexuality and gender. And that's a topic which, I mean, you just see, see these things now about this rape culture and stuff. And it's, oh, it's going batty. It's going batty. Um, so yeah, I think we should start talking about hard topics. May, may, I, may I add that um, Gary, who is not here, has put a, a quite a, a long list that I'm looking at at the moment on Reddit of points that he was wanted to bring up uh, that was to do with what you're saying. Uh, I, I looked at his points and they're really interesting. Uh, they could be good starts for conversation and whatever you yeah, think. Yeah, go for uh, it. But, sure. uh, Let's start that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. but the first thing he talks about the the spiritual aspect when he says the trans people might be missing the call to find their true self instead arriving at a new egoic self and yeah that's... jesus i believe that yeah and then um, a comparison to the bodily modification native people go into from elongated lips ears and necks to all manner of scarification and an amazingly ex extreme example i i would describe and a, a few other things he talks about, but we could go back to that later on. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Let's let's, yeah. let's, let's start on that because the the first thing uh, to talk about is is the kind of surgeon. It's a fad of body modification and this idea of gender dysphoria. Just there's an epidemic of gender gender dysphoria, and so we. You shouldn't just take it as something that is new. I think anybody that's listening to this is a contentious subject because people might have had, you know, gender surgery or they might be thinking they're gay or straight or something. So what we're trying to do is we're not trying to bash anybody. We're trying to get deeper to see somebody to try, try and understand the whole thing as a phenomena and not, not get personal. So, and the whole point of doing that is that, you know, Nobody has to go to the gas chambers if, if we understand it. If, if you do ego bashing and everybody stands up for gay rights, I'm telling you, somebody's going to the gas chambers. You put, put down that rainbow flag, man. That, anybody that raises a flag, I don't care what's on it, somebody's going to the gas chamber at the end of that. Just, you just take that as red. That is not the way to go. Fighting for gay rights or LBGTQ and stuff is like, nope. That you are fighting for an ego, and what you're doing is you're creating the shadow of that ego in the opposite. And one day that the shadow will be in supremacy. In supremacy, you might be in supremacy now, laughing your head off at cancel culture and stuff. The shoe will be on the other foot, and then basically that other foot is a big boot, especially for people that that are are gay and stuff like that. You don't see how big that boot is in Nazi Germany. So just, you know, so if you are gay and stuff, before you get your ego hackles up, you know, I'd say we're fighting your side. <laughs> we're trying to keep you out of the gas chamber. So uh, you're not, so first off, you're heading for a gas chamber. What you're doing now is, is exactly the wrong thing psychologically to be doing. So what you should, let's start with uh, trying to understand it. And the first thing to do is just to say it's a phenomenon, an increasing phenomenon. There is something lost 
in where it came from. What people don't notice now is suddenly everybody is, you know, having gender alteration, having trans and LGBTQ rights. It started off in the 80s. Okay, let's go from the female, born female, cis female gender. It started in the 80s as, and the first sign of this phenomenon was um, anorexia nervosa and, and bulimia. So they were eating disorders. Now you say, well, what's eating disorders got to do with being trans? Well, a lot, especially in women. See, what what is behind body shaming and the things that uh, people started, women, young girls in particular, prepubescent girls, started starving themselves. And the psychology behind that is quite well understood by psychologists. And it's trying to delay puberty. So what they trying to do is they see their breasts coming out and they basically they try and starve themselves get, get the fat out of their body um, and just stop themselves maturing into women and the reason is that they have anxiety about fulfilling the role of a woman there's particularly association with things like childbirth and a, a, a terror of going through childbirth and you know basically it's pretty freaking traumatic and i tell you I think I speak for most men, whereas I'm glad I'm not a woman. <laughs> I, 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 what I know about childbirth is freaking secondhand. But I know, I know childbirth hurts like fuck because my wife's fingers went into my hand and fucking hell, it hurt like shit. So I know firsthand that, you know, childbirth is agony. Women don't like that joke. But the, but, uh, the, the thing is that we went from there, it wasn't addressed, the thing about bulimia and um, and eating disorders, it wasn't addressed in the 80s. There was a, a campaign to stop uh, body shaming and to address um, the, the, it was addressed in, in terms of obesity and, and eating disorders. Um, it didn't go away, it re-emerged as uh, tattooing and um, and body piercing, and particularly now uh, gender alteration and, and transitioning. Um, and it's, it's more prevalent on the female side. So I feel very strongly that, although it's contentious, I feel very strongly that it's to do with our society and where our society has got to. I think that most uh, girls today that are feeling that they have gender dys dysphoria, they actually are really just feeling depressed about where the world is and you know basically society so they're taking on all the angst of our society and and uh, then there's now a group of trans people that are are, are um, they amount to a cult and they are saying you know they are reinforcing their cult identity as um, trans people and recruiting so now this is something that's well known throughout the ages and it goes all the way back now now to Sibylle. So if you look at the hijra in India, they do this too. The hijra are also a kind of a cult of, of eunuchs and, um, and they can't grow by most religious cults. They have kids like the Catholic, Catholics and the um, Islamic uh, cults. They, they grow by indoctrination. The biggest growing religion now, apart from atheism, and, and is, him, is um, uh, Islam. And it's not growing by recruiting or conversion. It's growing because they're just having more kids. So it's the same with atheists, atheists uh, as well, I guess, are having more kids. But that's the way it's growing, is, is childhood indoctrination into the thing. So the hijra are doing kind of like what trans people are doing, they, they, it's not unknown for the hijra to actually kidnap kids, especially if they are feminine and look like they could be gay, to kidnap them and, you know, cut their, cut their balls off, make them, you know, uh, mutilate them and then put them in dresses and so they become part of the hijra. So mm -hmm. it's, so that, that is, I can see that happening or, already in the, the trans culture. Now, the, there's uh, something in the trans culture that it's worth investigating. Is what's going on with something that's so unnatural that uh, 
it means that you can't perpetuate, perpetuate yourself. You can't propagate as an organism. Now, it's, it's this basic biology that, for obvious reasons, animals that don't value their progeny or their ability to procreate or their genitals can't procreate. And if there's a gene for that, you die out very quickly. So it's, it is unnatural because, you know, it's terminal. It's, it, for example, if you take all the, the, the trans people and gay people now, they, they're not going to be able to breed. I mean, you can have artificial wombs and they're doing research into artificial wombs and uh, transplants of wombs into males and stuff. But this is, is not, uh, you're not going to get a successful line of breeding organisms this way. Even if you do it by, by technical means, you have X and Y chromosomes and you have the you know, laws of procreation and biology and you can't get around them with technical means. Even if you do, it'll cost money and either way, and if you just take a competitive Darwinian landscape, you're onto a loser for, for basically a population that tries to thrive this way. So, do you want to say anything, Sophie? Those like yes, and infertility is growing anywhere since the 80s, uh, everywhere, not just in Europe and America, but also in China and India. Um, so there is there is also that that element um, that's. I, I, I think it's coming from various causes, as much as environmental and, and also uh, rise of sexually transmitted infections, all sorts of other things. But the, it's, it's startling, the, the infertility. It is, and I think it, one of the big things is people are having children later where their fertility is, is much, much lower. So, uh, you know, if you had your kids at 16 or 17, you wouldn't have that problem. You, you'll have it at 30, 35, 40. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but, but also the petrochemicals and the yeah. estrogen mimics and stuff, they also delaying, um, well, they they acting like the pill. In fact, the the pill is taken so much now that, uh, you know, it's in, in the water supply in the sea, it's turning all the seals off Britain into females. There's so much estrogen in the water. But estrogen is a simple molecule and then a lot of mimics, especially in the petrochemical industry and plastics. Yeah. Uh, but the pill, the pill is mimicking the pill, the pill is mim mimicking a pregnancy, in in yes. certain ways. It's it's replaced the, the the multiple pregnancies that women used to have before, and it sort of starts them at eighteen or seventeen or sixteen, uh, with a prolonged series of pregnancies. Where the so, but where a pregnant woman would have a lot of estrogens and a lot of other hormones that would be going in the environment uh, by the urine, it would be normal hormones, but natural hormones, but the ones that are excreted by the pill takers is a complete different type of estrogen and progesterone because they're nearly all synthesized in labs. Uh, yes. So, you know, you're talking, uh, but it is actually, it is actually what it's doing, uh, actually. And, and there's something very interesting because uh, when they invented the pill, uh, in the 60s, the, the, because it was going to stop the ovulation, everybody understands that, it was going to stop the periods. So they said, oh my God, what are we going to do? Because first, um, the church didn't like that, uh, the industry didn't like that, because they were selling tampons and all sorts of protections. So we say, oh, we're going to give a little gap in the pill. So you, the women are going to take it for 21 days, and for seven days, they're going to have a little withdrawal bleeding that is absolutely artificial so that things will stay a little bit like they used to be, which is an enormous um, uh, lie. And it's, it's become, I had to, I, I, when I was explaining that to some patients in the family planning clinics where I worked, they said, but do you mean we could be taking the pill all the time without having this? I said, yeah, it has absolutely no medical effect. But it is, it's one of the examples of, of the manipulation. But the church and the industry wanted women to have this little withdrawal bleed that you would never have during a pregnancy. And it has no medical basis. It has, I've read in numerous articles through the 90s and 2000s about that. There's absolutely no medical reason to do that. And uh, it's, what can you do? The packaging comes in 21 little tablets that the lady takes and stops religiously for seven days 
to mimic a 28-day 28, 28 natural cycle. Mm. Yeah, so, but in terms of the, you know, unsustainability of the culture is, um, of trans, the trans culture is, you know, the industrial society is making people infertile for so, so many reasons, but I think there's, there's one of them is, just the plain unhealthiness of in, in just the stress and unhealthiness apart from all the, the chemical side effects i believe that there is something in hunter gatherers hunter gatherers the evidence is that they self-regulated their populations and so the female body uh under stress will not have kids if you you know they it's after the war then it, it shows a spike in demographics. All the baby boomers came back and they had, and then they say, well, all the GIs came home and <laughs> banged their wives. I, I don't think that's the case. I think what happened was that they, there was a feel good boom. And because women felt good, it was a prosperous time. You know, the, the, on the stock exchange, they'll tell you in good times when the money's flowing, the, you can tell from the hemlines of where the women's hemlines were the economy is and so you know basically what women are doing is revealing more leg when the men have more money <laughs> is what's happening so in a feel-good time of prosperity after the war then uh, that that led to the baby boomers but it it was hormonal far more than demographics or something about the logistics yes, yes. in the concentration camps uh, women had no period no ovulation yeah, because it's, it's it, it, your body knows that you're under stress and you're in a place where you yeah hunger in the hunter gatherers hunger would stop ovulation so that that therefore you wouldn't have children because you'd be hungry, uh, you can feed them so there was yeah, there was the ovulation. Is, mm. your, your woman's body is very keyed into the natural environment so it knows that this because you don't want you don't want to invest in in kids and stuff uh, that that don't have a future so so. I think hunter gatherers were self-regulating, and now what's happening is that we are hunter gatherers, and and uh, women are doing some self-regulation. So this is not a good place to introduce kids into, and I think that's been happening since the 80s. And I think it's it, it's so it's not the I feel the the bulimia and anorexia nervosa, those eating disorders and stuff that are sexually related. Then it's not women malfunctioning. They're actually functioning correctly. What's happening is that our society is sending them signals that now, uh, now those same signals, a lot of the things like depression is not a disease. A depression is healthy. And what uh, women are depressed now, um, because this is not a good environment to bring up kids. A, there are too many people, and I believe that you know you have a, horm sense, a hormonal sensing of population too, and women can start to feel that, that there are too many people, and then their, their bodies will self-regulate. And I think that's more or less what's happening. So, but what's it starts to get a bit evil is when the alien cortex comes in. Well, so far this is all natural in the mammalian brain. Then you have these girls now that are feeling depressed, they're at home, they're on you know, social media with an iPhone, getting more and more depressed. This is good. Uh, what's not good is they're connected to social media and the alien cortex. And what people are doing on social media is they, they're forming a cult saying, the reason why you're feeling that is maybe your ego is wrong, maybe your ego identity is wrong and you really are a man. And then, then you get into, you know, big farmers very quick to get into one of these trends. Now, um, what liberals don't know is uh, under, under the, the undercurrent, the first time liberals and your grandma hears about LGBTQ thing, they, you know, they hear it because their grandson comes out as gay and they say, well, well, we won't have grandkids and we're very sorry, but we love Johnny and stuff. And they, they, now, there's another side to this that, that liberals don't know. And then what's been going on um, in the counterculture, in the trans culture, was for, since the gender euphoria of the 80s, there's been a, a castration cult that's been growing. And now this is very relevant to Sibylle. Um, Sibylle 
is the Magna Mater and the Mother Goddess. And if you have a look up, uh, you know, basically what she's famous for is her relationship to Attis. So Attis and the story of Attis, Attis castrated himself for the sake of Sibylle. And Sibylle was the, the patron goddess uh, in Rome before Christianity. And St. Peter is a usurper. He sits on Sibylle's throne in her temple. The Vatican is her temple. That's why it's built like a freaking womb in the temple of the time. It's, it's hers. It's not his. So, so he's a usurper. And now the, the, her adherents, her cult, the cult of Sibylle, they called Gali, and they made themselves eunuchs. And you say, well, I think we should go into the psychology of this because it's important for the trans community today and why there's an epidemic of self-castration, which is what's uh, what's going on here. So, um, first of all, what liberals don't know is in the counterculture movement, especially in the gay clubs of the 80s, the gay clubs in the 80s were devastated, absolutely devastated by AIDS. And I don't think uh, the, the middle class knew how bad it was, but it was wiped out. I mean, the, the, the gay scene in London went from absolutely thriving to, you know, asparagus patch. <laughs> like, you know, uh, and because so many guys died, particularly, yeah, gay guys died, uh, it made... It, it turned it from the opposite. I think the whole gay scene turned from the very opposite from gay. It turns into a very um, apocalyptic uh, kind of cult. And um, part of that, I, I can't help feeling that uh, castrations came in there. So, so what happened was um, all the way through after 2000 and the last two decades, <clears throat> Before you had all these gender clinics, where these gender clinics arose from was in the gay clubs. You would have these guys who called, um, <coughs> they called cutters, basically. So what would happen in, in the gay scene is that these, uh, these guys would get fascinated by the idea of castration. There were a bunch of guys, you couldn't go to, to a hospital or a doctor or, <clears throat> or go to the NHS or anything and, and get a sex change operation. So what the guys would do was there was a whole lot of backyard castrations. So there's, these cutter guys would, <coughs> some of them would run into the thousands. And it's important to go into what's going on in these kind of back backroom ceremonies, which now Big Pharma has stepped in, cashed in on. And in the gender clinics, I'm doing the same thing now, but now, <coughs> now they go to the, you know, diagnostic sorcery manual, which is just a billing codes for insurance. As long as you get gender dysphoria in there, then you can have it billed to insurance, then it's big money, then they make an industry, <coughs> then they start promoting it, they start giving money to propagate the LBGTQ uh, cult. Uh, but it's for profit, um, and it, so, and it's it's not very good for anybody because you know this this is not a cult that can breed other than cop, you know copying people by mind. So it basically captures people's minds and their mindset, and it has to be active in that kind of recruitment to keep to keep it going and to keep the cult growing. Now. Those cutters. Okay, so what the hell is going on there? Now, to, to the average guy, including me, you can't imagine anything worse than having your balls cut off. So why do these guys go and do it? It just seems like absolutely horrible. And a large part of the reaction on the right is, is you know, the, there's this huge pressure to say, oh, you should be accepting of people. And I have to say, well, yeah, I mean, that's very nice for a trans person. But the trans people, I've never seen a trans person that gives a shit about the horror that this in, in you know, that doing this to yourself induces in a healthy male. 
So it, it's incredibly one-sided and selfish, and this is all about me and my journey of self-discovery and stuff, and fuck you and the rest of the world. And you say, like, yeah, you can't hurt my feelings by not using the right gender pronoun. And I say, do you know what it does to my feelings that you cut your balls off? I can barely stay in your presence in case I catch the disease. So if you say about, you know, that now men are scared that it is an infectious disease, and it is. If you look, if you go back at, at uh, Catus, uh, Catullus, Catullus wrote a poem about Sibylle and Attis. And he ends the poem. I, 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 I struggled re uh, very, very hard to understand Sibylle and Attis, but I think I eventually got it. But the key to why Attis castrated himself is very, very apropos for today. And and eventually got it, and I believe it's what Catalyst said. He said it straight out. He said, he said, Atus mutilated himself out of hatred of Venus, I Sibylle. And he ends he ends the poem by saying, you know, you know, keep this away from me for you know, for God's sake, don't let, let me go down that path. Giving you a clear indication that Catalyst himself is horrified by the act of self mutilation, but can see the attraction of it too. So so what the hell is going on here? Well it's closely bound to, to Eros and Thanatos. And it's pure Thanatos to try and stop yourself propagating to end your line. You know, you've got four point three million years of people passing on, you know, basically sacrificing themselves for their children in this chain ladder that we've passed on. And then you just unequivocally come and say, it stops here. I, the, you know, I have thousands and thousands of ancestors and they are disappointed in me. I will not propagate. It is a, an effort of finality and death uh, that's, the, that is, is very strong. Now, that, that is not unattractive. It's, it's Thanatos. Everybody has a death wish in them to a certain extent. But, uh, so, yeah, so, so, but that's one aspect of it. But there's also an aspect of, uh, like, self-reinforcement, like, uh, like tinnitus. I've always thought that tinnitus is, um, is an obsessive re reaction. So you start, everybody can hear the blood in their ears. And some, at some stage, if you listen carefully enough, you can start to hear and you notice it. Once you notice it, you start saying, oh, I, yeah, I can hear it. It sounds louder. You reinforce it. it so, so something similar happened to me with a girlfriend. I had an Asian girlfriend who said she wouldn't use any toothpaste on a toothbrush. And I, I asked her, why? And she said, I, no, toothpaste makes me gag. And I said to her, well, how can toothpaste make you gag? That's ridiculous. And the next time I was brushing my teeth, <laughs> I went, how can toothpaste make you gag? And I went, and suddenly I tasted the toothpaste in the back of my throat and I went, <laughs> and I went, oh shit. <laughs> now, to this day, <laughs> every time I brush my teeth, I have to concentrate. If I lose concentration, I go, <laughs> Stop. And it's because of her. She just said that once. So the auto suggestion. As soon as I saw it, I started reinforcing it. Now that a lot of that is going on with, with these uh, with these guys, but not so much the girls, the guys. Um, so, for example, I'll give you one example. This guy, who who I heard of, and he said why why he got a sex change operation. He did, okay. First of all. Your grandma thinks, oh, you know, this is a guy who wants to be a girl. Not so much. I haven't met a lot of guys that want to be girls. A lot of it is alienation from their body, and then particularly to their genitals. So, you know, they can... Uh, there's, there's a thing, V.S. Ramachandran uh, has done a lot of research into, like, phantom limbs, and uh, I can't remember what it's called, apoprognosia, you know, something like that. But it's, it's really people that... Uh, are absolutely convinced that the the arm or some limb is not theirs, and they can even draw a line exactly where it is, and they insist on having that arm amputated, and it's it's a, a body disorder. It's quite rare, but it's uh, you know they can find fascinating things about neurology out of studying this. 
Now, the same effect you can get on your genitals. You start looking at your genitals thinking, you know, these are the way I am for a man. These are the things how I'm trapped by sibling. I'm, I'm attracted to women, and but I know they're going to get me, domesticate me, put a ring on my finger, take all my freedom, and you'll be sucked in, and you'll be just absorbed into this black hole in this cocoon where she's going to keep you like Delilah. The, the Delilah and Samson what is the cutting of the hair in Delilah. And some, it's a euphemism for basically cutting your balls off. It's basically women... You know, the part of being a primate for gender relations is for a female to keep the male sexually satisfied. And the reason is to stop him straying and keep him on a leash. So so men can feel this leash very strongly. They want to basically spread their seeds like Johnny Appleseed. And the woman wants wants them basically to stay in the home and be a slave. The women are the first slave owners. So men want to be free. Uh, but they are attracted, hugely attracted to 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 Sibley and to women, and that's um, that can become a focus in people's genitals. Say that this is my leash. This, if I didn't have balls, I'd be free. So, so basically, they get caught up in the thing that you know I can't live with women. I can't kill them. <laughs> now that that's kind of um, dissonance between not not being able to be trapped but you know wanting to be free but not not being able to be free and that this indecision and this ambivalence can become such a burden that it can become focused on say your genitals where you say like this is the source of the problem i i wouldn't be attracted to them i wouldn't have, you know need to stray i would be free of this whole issue and it becomes it becomes that kind of thing now i believe that it, we're supposed to be in this ambivalent state. It's wrong to think in terms of a solution, to think in terms of, well, it should be like this. No, it should be that way. I believe what it is is because we're hunter-gatherers and men are supposed to not be comfortable in the home or outside. They're supposed to be kept, you know, between the two. They're supposed to go out on the hunt they're supposed to come back from the hunt and, you know, and be attracted to the home. But then, you know, it, all these marriage counselors and that are operating from the principle that we should all be happy and healthy and live together as couples in a nuclear family. I say, no, we had to gather us. What they're trying to do is completely artificial and it's basically part of our industrial slave culture. Men are supposed to go out of the house, go out hunting and stuff and bring back the meat. But we, you know, now we force people into a home and we don't give them any outlet. So we don't let men go to make a killing in the city because that's been taken over by women and they all hunt and gathering around the offices while he's like, oh, we need to you know, conquer the world and make a killing. And all the women are saying, yeah, 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 they're so masculine and patriarchy. And you know, so the guy can't do his job, which is hunting in the office. That's been taken away from him. And so what men do is they start going out and they're doing fishing. And basically, you, you'll find a lot of men in any, any, any place you go to, in, say, in Greece, which is changing slowly, you can, you can find a lot of guys sitting in, you know, fishing. And you saying, like, any one of them, I know what they're doing. So they're just escaping the wife. They don't give her, they, you can see they don't give a shit about the fishing. They never catch anything and they have an hour or one hour. The guys are in boats and doing all of this shit. And the reason is they're supposed to be out hunting and they're no hunting ground. So modern civilization has taken away the hunting grounds. In the 60s, there was a, they could go into the office. Men could go, go to the office and get all the adrenaline out and in this kind of um, masculine way. Um, and, and they would say it was in the language, you know, I made a killing in the city and stuff. And then, um, uh, you know, that was what men felt work was. But that's kind of been taken away. You're not allowed to see the work as that. You have to see it like from the woman's point of view, which is we, men and women have to, the reason why there's such problem in the workspace and employment and stuff is because men and women are using different, they mean different things when they mean work. So. So work for a man is conquering. It's like going out and bringing down an antelope or a mammoth 
and then bringing it back and feasting on it and feeling really good and having a kip and a screw and a kip. <laughs> and then, then uh, that's not what work is for women. When women go into the workplace, they're hunter gatherers. They think it's convivial. We must be all nice. The mammalian brain wants to share because of the brood. It's very important in a brood that you don't favor, you know, you don't have favorites and you keep everything nice. And so women think in terms of if you see women doing business, even a woman CEO, they think of it as going out and gathering and finding opportunities and bringing them back and then sharing. And then they want equality of wages and stuff. And for men, so like it doesn't seem right in their brains because equality in, in their wage packet is, is like whoever can bring down the biggest mammoth gets the prestige and basically gets the meat and basically gets to screw the best woman. And so that's what we evolved to do. Now that's taken away by saying, no, if you do, you know, the same work, you get the same pay packet. Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, the work you're talking about is a substitute for what we're really talking about. And that's in the male term, that's hunting. And the female term, that's gathering. So already there's a mismatch now. The hunting and gathering has been distorted into marketing or some shit like that or you know project management or something it's it's a, a false substitute for what we're really supposed to be doing and then then you then women say well we we should have equal outcome you know what you do after you do pick all the berries is you stick them all in a communal basket and you everybody shares they have a potlatch and, and shares so that's what the mammalian brain is telling you to do and so it's it's unworkable. They tell you the modern work environment and the industrial work environment is unworkable. We're, we're not, we're hunter gatherers and we're not suited for this. And all these debates about equal pay and stuff is, is like, all it's saying is guys, this doesn't work. You know, there's no resolution to this because the problem is in our neurology, you, you're taking millions of years of evolution and you're, and you're saying you cannot get substitutes the modern environment for our hunt together it is not an adequate replacement and the result is we're taking all these things on the nose personally and one of the ways people are taking it personally is in this ego identity and particularly women now they're feeling this all fucked up and what their bodies are saying is in a fucked up environment like this this is not a good place to bring up kids they are absolutely right their body is working tip top and now you know pharma and stuff is coming in and saying no there's solutions you can alter your gender it's because you know you you you've got to look at your ego or something like that you know and so 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 okay so so let's go back to the cutters and stuff in in clubs now what 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 is happening there's i'll give you one example of one one story i heard of uh, and this is the tinnitus thing of how you can become obsessed with your own genitals and uh, and them as a threat or a problem to you, a life problem. And instead of dealing with the psychology of, you know, sexual attraction and repulsion and uh, gender relations, you focus that into, say, this is a huge ball of wax that I cannot cope with. You focus that, say, Look, if I didn't have genitals, the problem would be gone. I would be neuter. If I was neuter, I wouldn't have to get into sexual dimorphism. I wouldn't have to have relationships that were sexual. I could have, you know, in, um, I could have intellectual relationships that would just be done at the level of the alien cortex. So the alien cortex is telling you a lie, and it's saying, you know, you know, this this is something I cannot I cannot take the other four brain layers and all this shit. So I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with it by cutting the, you know, basically the power and the engine of, say, your your amygdala or your reptilian brain. And to do that, you you alter your gender, and, and particularly for a male, you castrate yourself. So now, once you start thinking in terms of um, that that kind of limbus warrior as, as your genitals is alien to yourself and a problem. Uh, you very quickly get into the issue of, of life and death. It's a life and death issue, whether you actually procreate or not. So here's the story. Here's the story about uh, the, this one guy. So, so one guy, he, he said that he, he did gender surgery because he first, it goes back to when he was a kid on a bus. And he said he was standing on a bus and 
you know, all the kids were swaying backwards and forwards, and there was this big psychopathic bully, and he he fell backwards into the the guy and pissed him off. So the bully grabbed the guy by the nuts and squeezed them and said, like he said, "Do that once more, asshole, and I'll crush him." And see now, that act is is evil, and it's evil because it's it's focused uh, the guy's attention uh in a way that is you know basically think of it he's put under threat by a bully life or death threat everything in his brain is saying this gorilla is going to kill me and and basically the what the bully has done is focused it on his genitals so he's saying like uh, um it's it's like using a taser on somebody and it's it, if you go back to the videos a while back that i did with the grab him by the pussy this is this is i mentioned all this about trump he was doing the same thing to a woman by grabbing by the pussy. It's got nothing to do with sex. It's got to do with power and control. So basically what you're doing is, is, is tasing somebody in the crotch. It's very easy to grab somebody by the crotch and um, give them a shock, a powerful psychological shock. Uh, it's, it's as good as an electric shock. In fact, in I have mentioned this too. In, in some ashrams in India and stuff, at a certain point in your spiritual development, the guru might walk up to you and uh, grab your nuts and basically it will it'll send you completely into transcendent now the real, what's happening there is a, he's arousing kundalini so the basically there's a lot of energy in terms of you know the nervous system and the sacrum bone and all these nerves that go up and we, we talked about all of that but you can awaken kundalini in somebody just by grabbing their nuts or grab them by the pussy and and Trump found his way to that is almost certainly a psychopath that's pushing the boundaries can find those kind of buttons. And it's horrendous that he, 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 he broke so many social taboos to find his way to, to that one. But now after this guy on the bus who had that, he couldn't get the thought of, you know, basically of sexual arousal when, whenever he thinks of his nuts being crushed by this guy. So it, does does that make any sense to people, or do do, do, do I need to go into why? <laughs> you see, you see that it's it's a power relation, and um, it's it basically what it's it's focusing all his attention um, into life and death uh, into basically his nuts. So. It, every time he thinks about that, it's like tinnitus. It's self-reinforcing. So he becomes obsessed by his, by his own nuts. Uh, so the going back to the cutters, right? So so what happens? And this is important for liberals <laughs> who like eh, LGBTQ understand the psychology of what's going on here. What happens in the dark rooms where these these cutters are? Is these guys like say this guy on the bus would then be uh, gender dysphoric? Uh, not not you already distorted his what that the bully on the bus has done is already distorted and made made him uh, you know changed say a sexual attraction which is quite different into a power relation. So you what the bully has done is fused sex and power. In one thing, just with by grabbing him by the nuts. You see, if you if you grab him by the nuts, it's powerless. So it's 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 kind of the same as rape. It's it's showing the guy, I have ultimate control over you. I have control of life and death over you because it's it's your progeny. It's the core and essence of a man that is testicles. So it, I mean, just take the word testicles. Right? When when people testify. Um, they put their hands here. If you testify before the Lord, you go like this. Now, what people don't understand the symbolism. Testify comes from the ancient Rome. It's saying it's from testes. And what you're saying is with your hand up like this is not saying hand before God. This is saying, I, I will cut my nuts off. So it says if you're taking a, 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 a blood oath on your, on your genitals. You're saying with this knife, I will cut my genitals, and that's what you're doing when you testify. So that's kind of lost in our in our culture, but it shows you that basically, if you're taking a life oath on saying I, I will not 
I will not procreate, I will end my line, in, in fact, I will die in my body, and I will no longer be a viable human uh, organism uh, if I break this oath, and that's what you're doing. That's why you should never testify. You never testify. That's why they, they put it in the extinction Adi thing. You never, never, never take an oath, never make a contract. What you're doing is a version of that. You're bonding yourself to say, I will cut the nuts off my future self if I break this oath. And you say, like, oh, oh, man. So that's what the guy's doing. He's basically uh, on the bus. The bully is forcing him to testify. He's saying, I have power over you. If you, if you, if if you disrespect me by falling on me again in this bus, I I will uh, basically kill you. Is in essence what he's saying. Worse than kill you. Most men would rather die than have their nuts cut off. It, but very often, people that are about to go into into surgery for have an orodectomy or something, they'll kill themselves. As you ask anybody in a the hospital, they'll tell you that. So so this is a, a hell of a thing, and you think now let's go to the cutters in these little rooms doing this little ceremony. Now that guy on the bus, it becomes a huge obstacle and his whole existential thing is really focused on his nuts. Now, when he, go, he goes into the, the cutter, he's really committing suicide. So, so really that, that burden of control from the bully is basically the, the bully's avenue to control him is his nuts. So if you see, follow the crude logic of it, is if he can lose his nuts, he would lose, the, bu the bully would lose control of them, right? Does that make all sense? It's basically you'd be free from the power relationship because it was established around his biggest fear. So, 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 but it's also a kind of case of the whole situation is completely intolerable, psychologically intolerable. The mere fact that there are people that can walk up to you and take control of you is intolerable for a human being to live under that, that threat. Um, so, so it becomes a, a, kind of a way out uh, is, is a kind of a suicide. So you can either commit suicide or you can cut your nuts off. They're both kind of equivalent. But anyway, you get the idea that like tinnitus, the more the guy thinks about this, the more he gets obsessed about it. The more, the more he thinks about you know, having his nuts cut off, the bigger um, erotic thrill it gives him, a psycho-erotic thrill it gives him. And eventually he will be in the club talking to other guys and they will start saying, hey, you know, oh, Jim, if you want it done, Jim does it. Now, this is what Jim's going to do. So Jim is kind of like the psychopath. Jim's probably, he's cut the nuts off about 50 guys. And what he does is he, he, he has an orgasm. If he gets a sexual thrill out of castrating guy. Why? Because it's his death coping mechanism. See, if he he's doing he's making a sacrificial lamb out of these other guys. He's basically saying, if I sacrifice your nuts, that saves my nuts. It's it's it, and, and he's getting a sexual thrill out of it. So now both these guys in a little back room, they get a sexual thrill out of it. Now what you'll see a lot of guys um, obsessing about it. Uh, I, I saw something, yeah, uh, in that Derek Jensen video, that, that woman was talking about, hey, this guy, I can't remember, some celebrity YouTube influencer, and he, he has a you know, pre-castration party with everybody around. Now, that is very, very close to the Hilaria with Sibylle, right? So the this today is the Hilaria and the day of joy. It's basically that the day of blood is the day after, the guys have cut their nuts off. The day, it's the day of joy because then they're free. They, they, they're no longer in the game. The game is, you know, can I progeny? So it's, they're no longer in the Darwinian game and they're free of it. So they, you know, getting a huge amount of joy. They're the living dead, of course. <laughs> and it doesn't really work as a strategy. It doesn't work biologically. It doesn't turn out like they think. But going back to the, the guys, the cutter guys, the more obsessed they get about this thing, they're getting a neurotic high out of it. They get becoming erotically obsessed with the whole again, it's like suicide. If you if the if you see about guys who commit suicide, uh therapists and that will tell you 
that they get obsessed with the way of suicide. So they don't, they, killing yourself is an abstract thing. Nobody, you know, just gets, decides to kill themselves. They, they get obsessed by a way. They get obsessed by a bridge or a gun and it reinforces itself. And so, so they'll start, if they, if it's a bridge, they'll start seeing, you know, the ap apophenia, they'll start seeing references to bridges and messages to bridges and more and more of stuff that they interpret as jump off the bridge. And so it gets off and reinforcing and the same with people that think of pills or guns or ropes or something like that. It's, uh, you know, they become obsessed of that, that mechanism uh, because it's self reinforced. So these guys are doing something similar. The more they think about um, castration, the more they they getting into that mode of uh, of suicide. Now, this is very deep because we have a natural. Everybody has a natural inc inclination to self transformation. It's it's we are almost like snakes in a way that we do kind of shed our skin of our youth and and metamorphosize. And it's built into our psychology. It should be built into our culture, but it's not. We've lost it. But the the idea of maturing into puberty, into uh, <clears throat> maturing and transforming from from uh, like a pupa stage to a butterfly stage is is built into us biologically and psychologically. And so this is a is a uh, sublimation of it. This, what what's happening in this culture is the culture of transformation is being distorted and put into this kind of thing. It's saying the transformation is a death. It's the death of the old self, the youth, and the emergence into the adult. So uh, it is a very, very real death. But it gets distorted into these things like suicide. And then it becomes focused with an object like a gun or castration. Now, uh, it's charged, massively charged, sexually charged, and sexually powerful. So what the what often the guys will do that are going to go through this, they become obsessed with the orgasm. That, so so what the, what the, happens is both guys, the cutter and the guy having his nuts cut off, has an orgasm. They basically how it's done is the guy, you know, puts a elastic band around the guy's nuts, takes him to orgasm, and at the point of orgasm, wah, the blade comes and cuts him off. And that that's what's happening with Sibylle and Atis. That's what the Galli did in ancient Rome in those festivals. This is the day. This is the day they did it. This is why it's so terrible. So so but you see the the when you hear of that, if you're a normal guy, you go, oh my God, you're just about faint. The blood runs out of you. But you think think of it from this guy's point of view, is he he's getting more and more of a charge out of it. Eventually, the, you know, this is becomes a focus of his life. <laughs> did, did, Sophie, did you faint? <laughs> do you, want to, do you, want, you want to come up for air? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I didn't faint. No worry. I was just getting the dog outside. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, so basically that, that's, but you see the guys become more and more focused on, you know, this is, maybe I should wait for, for Sophie to get back. Cause she, yeah, she should probably, that just yeah. sounds brutal. Yeah, so it, it does, I but can't. you see, you you have to see it from the point of yeah. view of it's it's the rapture it becomes right. a substitute for a rapture and it becomes a substitute so so what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to go through this mental transformation and psychological transformation and it is that potent but if it gets deviated and this is where it gets very deep so you know i've talked about macchio and stuff before but this is the biggest the worst form of macchio and what the alien cortex increasingly why you see it happen more and more in civilized society is because as we get civilization is part of the alien cortex is it's it's an its environment it's its home territory uh, it's doing niche creation and creating an environment that's best suited for propagation of alien cortex so but what what it's doing is substituting this transformation that will kill your alien cortex 
it's saying, no, no, don't kill me, kill my balls or something like that. So it's 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 a it's a it's a sacrifice just like Isaac. So Isaac, you know, is ready to sacrifice his son. What Isaac is doing is supposed to sacrifice himself, his alien cortex. But instead, he, he goes like, I'm not killing myself, fuck that. So Makyo, he substitutes his son for himself, is saying like, well, I love my son almost as much as myself. So let's say it's a 99%er. Uh, okay, if I kill my son and offer him to God, uh, the alien cortex, I'm off the hook, okay? That's the psychology. Uh, and then in the Bible, then, you know, the angel stays Isaac's hand. And he said, like, and then they is like, yeah, because what the angels stay is is his mammalian brain that's saying, dude, you can't kill your own son for the alien cortex. Don't do it. And so was, that, saying, was that yeah. Abraham? Oh, Abraham. Oh, yeah. yeah Abraham yeah. and Isaac. Isaac is the one who's going to get the chop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anyway, you can see how traumatized Isaac's going to be out of this. There ain't no good coming out of this story. So there's this traumatized kid. He's got this little kid who's going to, he's going to you know, imagine what's the psychology of near death that this he's giving this kid a near death experience. Of course, Abraham can not give a fuck because he's an alien cortex and a psychopath. And he doesn't give a shit about the trauma he's putting his son in. It's just about him and his religion. He's, he's almost like a trans person. It's like, this is about me and my God and, you know, fuck my son and what I'm putting through and all his feelings. It's, I'm going to do this for my alien cortex and my ego. And he's just about to stick the knife in. Luckily, his mammalian brain steps in and he says, oh, an angel saved me. <laughs> Too right, an angel saved me. I mean, but psychology isaac's fucked and read the rest of the bible did, did, you, did you did you watch that uh, animation by uh, nina pelly you know the the sadomasochism uh, uh, yeah. video posted yeah, on Reddit. Right, yeah. and, and like, there's a lot of references to that in it, it it's um yeah, yeah. It's, it's, mm -mm. Well, well this is this is how you perpetuate trauma and this is this <laughs> is what they're doing and then and then what do they do they go and get a goat so in other words okay we got rid of the sun but we're still doing substitution and we substitute a scapegoat and all well and good. And that's the Passover, whatever the blasted festival it's the, you I, I must say that for, for a woman, what you're talking about seems to be very alien to me uh, for, from my point of view. Yeah, because for good reason. I'm if this wasn't you, alien to you, we would go extinct. As a, as a doctor, I've, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of things and I've looked after a lot of mutilated men and uh, not well, women. Well, 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 hopefully I'm giving uh, you an insight. You see, you I, see I would say that they are, they are totally taken hostage by, by the pharmaceutical for life and that they are yeah. going to be in hospitals for life. They're going to have high risks. Of, we had to screen. We had to screen men who had been uh, castrated for their normal problems of prostate, but we also had to screen them for breast cancer because yeah. they were taking yeah. hormones. And uh, yeah, I, I don't want to get into no. the consequences too much. I, I just want to help you understand the psychology. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it should feel alien to you because Completely. basically if, if you understood any of this, it no. wouldn't be good for our species. If women well, understood this naturally, our species yeah. would die out. There's some knowledge you're not supposed to have. <laughs> uh, oh, and this. Yeah, but, yes, but I brought up the question in the in the comments under the the meeting from my gender point of view or gender or what I am is that I was interested also uh, in the aspects that you had talked about with Hank in the video that you did uh, a, nearly a year and a half ago, where you were talking about um, the the five layered brain and you were talking about the the. Uh, the gender-based amygdala and all these things and I was I might, I don't think we'll have time to bring this up today but maybe one day we could uh, I could look into it a bit and but uh, I would be very interested especially in the work that we're doing with spirituality and and the work we're doing with uh, you talk about Kundalini you talk about all these things and from my my point of view I hear a lot of things that are coming from a, a, another species the, the male species and I, I don't do you know it's it's I like it. It's it's part of what we're learning and everything, well, but it is very, very alien. Yeah, but you see what 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 I hopefully what I'm doing is I'm giving you uh, a, a fly on the wall look into the guy's locker room and into the guy's mind, even more than guys will admit to in, in the locker room, right? So so this is stuff guys know, but you can only go so far even in locker room talk. So 
So basically, we have we have what you can say in mixed company. Then you can say what you can have as say just guys. Then you can say what guys in the locker room, and then you know maybe guys in the shower, <laughs> you know, when it, when it got a bit dodgy. <laughs> but you know, the the beyond that, I'm talking about stuff that guys know that can't you know maybe talk to their therapist or something. So, but I think it's important to surface all of these things, and I think we should understand them all now. You are not going to talk about consequences, but have you encountered men who have been castrated, who underwent castration voluntarily, and have they expressed regret? Yes, afterwards, it, it's very common. You see, one of the reasons is that there are often complications. You see, these surgeries and that don't go. If, if you know what these guys go. Most guys, they get focused on the act. So they get focused on the orgasm and having the biggest orgasm, of their, and they don't think about what happens afterwards. A few do, and they get into the fem the gender aspects, and they start, you know, cross-dressing and stuff and getting into the feminine role. But, but like, they they go to a point where, you know, this is the final the final act, and then... then um, they think, oh, then, you know, then I'll be a woman. And they're not expecting that they will have a gaping gash that never heals for the rest of their life between their legs. And then that's something which the gay community never told them. Sorry, we never went into that one. And so, the, the you know, there's a lot of misinformation. And so it's, it's a cult thing. But we've gone into the situation where you can't say anything about LGBTQ thing because it's one of the cults you've got to respect the cults <laughs> so so we you know every now and then these cults come up and then sibylis came up in rome and you, if you said anything up against sibylli and the galley and stuff you'd be in serious trouble then christians came along and the pendulum swing the other way and if you were a galley they would be in real trouble but so the christian so so i want to go deeper into the psychology of this and particularly in sibylli and stuff so now, Christianity in general has had a problem with people self-castrating. It's one of the reasons things that uh, you know they don't talk much about. But the from the early church, it's the psychology of Christian transformation was also a distortion. They taking the shamanic transformation and saying you have to be re be reborn again in Christ. So there's another fucking cult. He says, you have to be reborn again as a woman and find your authentic self. And you have to be reborn again in Christ and find yourself as an authentic Christian. And everybody's got this story of how you have to be reborn again as, wait for it, spoiler alert, my ego. Yay. <laughs> Why is it always we, we're there for you? We're going to do the transformation. And what's going to happen at the end? You're going to be me. And it's like, oh, thanks for all this altruism. Are you not doing this just to reinforce your own ego, reinforce your own fucked up choice, trying to, you know, expand the mistake so it doesn't look so much like, like mistake? None of that, right? No, no, of course not. You're a hundred percent right because the, I've dealt with a lot of people in the aftermath of such atrocious operations, and and their their the reinforcement of the ego is is absolutely. I mean, it's just in front of you i i've experienced that uh, more than a dozen times in them and it's just you're in front of a, a citadel a thing that is just it's, it's, more, it's, more than a citadel it's it's a universe unto itself yeah so, so so you see what as breeders or fertile people that are in the line of progeny and this huge ancestry, uh, this family tree that goes forward, we are connected to the universe and the earth. We are very part of the material world. Now, emphasis on mater, the prima mater. The prima mater is the uh, Roman word for sibling. So the word material, when we say we are materialists, we say we are in Marta's world, mother material, mother Marta. So it's, it, it's um, we are connected to the, it's, it's like Kevin says, he says, like, you know, you're never going to understand this stuff unless you have fur in the game. I think the guys think I'm Jewish atheist gay or something, <laughs> so according to that, the, the way the, the, those guys think. But the, 
but I said, you know, I said in Discord that like say, no, I've got fur in the game. I, I've got two kids. Kind of baffling for them, I guess. But that, but you see, if you have kids, you've got a stake in the game. You, you, you're not. You see, you can't. You lose your ego by having kids. You have to, unless you're a complete bastard. You have to transfer some of your ego, some of your wealth some of your energy, some of your dreams, it's, it's some of yourself goes into this child. And that's what having children is all about, is, is you give up some of yourself to propagate yourself as somebody else. And it's not only biology, it's also psychology, it's finance, it's in every way. Now, what these people are saying is we're not, not in that game anymore. So we're not in this universe. This We're not in the universal game, mother martyr's game leela we out of the simulation we are an island unto ourselves we're not going to propagate we don't care about you know the world's overpopulated there are too many people we we're actually misanthropic now and what we care about is this universe and this universe is me and so it happened all the, it's 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 what happens to unix if you if you go back to china and you see the, the the guys that made themselves eunuchs so that they could serve as officials to the emperor. The emperor accepted them as eunuchs because they, they wouldn't be a threat. The idea was they wouldn't be a threat because you couldn't screw his concubine and stuff. And so then uh, they thought, well, if you don't have a, any, a dynasty, you can't be a threat to the king or the emperor. But they were wrong because what happens with the eunuch is they are they become their own dynasty and they become self-obsessed so they in so many ways i mean i I'm, i've got tra transference and stuff that the they there's this common theme which is well known if you read uh in the history of eunuchs and stuff is that they they become obsessed with food and with chocolate and with their own enjoyment and what happened in ancient china was they 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 became notoriously corrupt and they took all the wealth from the emperor and they built palaces and they had they loved all these you know kind of um um really enjoyments of life you know basically they loved all these hedonistic in, indulgences and and it got to a stage where there's a story where the emperor didn't couldn't understand why the the empire was falling apart and he is some some crafty astrologer told him well you should climb up to the stupa and uh survey the land and basically knowing that from the stupa he could see all the palaces of all his eunuchs which he never knew about he never knew that they were taking all his wealth and building their own palaces he thought he was in the clear because they didn't have a dynasty but he what he didn't realize they became their own dynasty and that's what most pe trans people will do. They become inordinately selfish. They can, they can empathize a bit with other trans people in, in the cult. But in, in essence, they are a closed universe that is not going to propagate. So it's a closed universe that, that, is, is not, uh, that has no outlet or future. And so guys on the far right, like Kevin, they, they often go about how nihilistic it is. And it, and it is nihilistic because it, the, there is a... It's it's a knowing terminus. So those those eunuchs in the in China, they they did that because they did a they did a um, a, a cost benefit assessment with the alien cortex, and they said like a lot of them will say like I gave up one pleasure, which is sex, so that I could have many pleasures and be rich and be like one of these court eunuchs. In if you. If you see the, the Unix today, I think they were maybe not long ago, maybe I think in the 80s, the last Imperial Unix died. And I, I remember seeing something where they interviewed him and they said, are you sorry for that? And he said, yes, because he said, "In that was the bargain I made. And, and they said, like, now I'm old, I have no family, and I'm going to die. I'm the last of my family, I'm the last of my line, and I'm alone. And so I regret it. And he said, well, that's it. That's, you know, he made himself into this closed universe. But you see, this, you see how terrible this is that these gender clinics 
uh, before these kids have reached the age of maturity, they are putting themselves into this position. It's it's a crime of monumental proportions. Yeah. Well, do we? I have a, a request. Could we could we continue the subject next week on this issue too? Because we haven't covered all the comments that Gary brought up and also some of the questions I had. Because we won't have much time. We've already been an hour and twenty minutes, nearly into the thing. Okay. Would that be okay? That we. This I, is a long thing. I mean, this is, could take. I know. Years. Personally, I'd like. I'd like to, to. I don't know. I'd like to have, get a few questions ready a bit more to, to get more, from my point of view. Because <laughs> there's only there's a, there's one man speaking here. There's one, two, three men there, and two women, and, and we're really on two different planes. And it would be interesting to, to exchange. It's great. Like I mean, and this is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I also we might have a... I don't know if we can do this from a woman's point of view, too, you see. I don't know. Because we don't do that between women. It's So many things are obvious, and I don't know. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that uh, the, so, these things are obvious to women, but men don't know that. You know that. Mm. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I've obviously like, you know, missed most of the conversation, but uh, I think I made a comment before when we talked like a long time ago in Destrada about art with the Mona Lisa. So when I was in high school, like, you know, I wasn't happy. I'm not going to go through all that and how miserable it was. But um, there's that assignment where we had to do a self portrait. And I remember it was just an emotional swirl. You know, it was sad, happy. And, you know, it was like a roller coaster ride painting that. So I painted myself as a female wolf in a cage because that self-portrait, you know, I was looking with more than my eyes was like my emotion. Everyone drew themselves as, you know, their normal self. They brought a photo and, you know, painted their own face. But I drew myself as a female white wolf in a cage. And I think if I if there's like some really prolific, you know, Internet narrative about transness, I probably could have got fucked up. But the fact that I thought to myself as a teenager that if I told people like if I put a narrative to it, no one would understand because, you know, most people are Christian and stuff and all that. The fact that I was alone and I would then put a narrative to that, I think that saved me. The fact that I was lonely and no one and I didn't tell like a Christian or a psychologist this. I but think the fact. Yeah. What you're saying is exactly what I wanted to bring up next time. It's the, the negation and, and, and Hugh has brought this up too. the negation of gender fluidity that exists naturally in, in us as hunter gatherers and as, as uh, fucked up civilized people. There is a gender fluidity that is not acknowledged in education and in, in, in life, in real life, in schools and everything. And, and that is the door open. Yeah. Yeah. Door it, is, you see? Uh, um, yeah. It, Mm. Yeah, and so yeah, and with, with, yeah, go ahead. With the yeah, so with that whole experience, not once did I even think about changing my body. Though that's the thing, the changing my body never occurred to me. It's just this experience that I couldn't describe. But you see, you're supposed to explore gender. It's part of being a human being and just being a functional human being is to explore gender. So, so people should know what the other gender is about and then gravitate towards some gender or other. It, in, you know, it naturally winds up being, say, one in 20 or something like that will um, you know, decide that they're gay or something like that. Now it's that is natural. The, the the problem is it's being hijacked now by the alien cortex. So all of these things are now in this natural process of discovery. Uh, the interests are financial interests, um, big pharma, the therapeutic in industry, um, the the cult of LGBTQ is uh, is is trying to recruit, um, and so. They're, they're all these things that have nothing to do with the individual and everything to do with all these ulterior motives and alternative interests. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's we sh we need to say get back to what do kids need, and a I'd say kids need 
a vehicle for self trans, you know, shamanic self transformation. They need the room to be able to explore genders, and I think, st I think Kevin is right that that they need to be role models. You 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 uh, this this whole you know gender fluidity is is uh, is different from gender confusion. So you you are almost deliberately causing mixed messages. Our school system does it. Just the fact that they have, you know, you could have, it's a potluck, whether you have a male tutor or female tutor or something like that. It's like, it's not supposed to matter. Well, it matters hugely. In other cultures, if you go and learn Japanese, it's like, I learned Japanese from, well, I started learning, I didn't get very far, but I learned Japanese from a woman. Nobody told me that. <laughs> I, I didn't understand. Well, I started tried to start talking Japanese to men. They just fell about laughing, and I couldn't understand why. And then they <laughs> told me, "Well, you can't get a woman to do." It. Basically, I came across a man who was like, "I was like, I think I was saying fucking gay," you know. I was like, I was like a flamboyant queen, and they were like, killing them so <laughs> and there was like, they, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, I was, I was a Westerner, was like, you know, it's a language. <laughs> it's like, no, it, but. It's terribly, terribly important that which role models you put up. So it's, uh, you know, like cats, as they develop, they know that the definite points that they get to in their development, some are a window of about a week. If you don't like let a kitten run after a ball in this narrow window of about a week, it will never be able to. It will never be able to see a ball. It will have blind sight. So, it, you know, if... So, but we're doing this to our kids, but we, we at crucial times when they're supposed to be doing stuff that's structured by the tribe and and um, gender role. You know, there's there's a definite point where kids should encounter you know sex and and stuff like this and be exposed to violence and blood and sex and death and. And if you delay them, they're terrible consequences. Or if you fudge them, they're terrible consequences. We just just ignore it. We just say, like, you're going to spend eight hours a day with this woman, and she's going to teach you how the world is. And you say, like, well, it'd be fucking, what kind of a misogynist are you? So it's like, that's a crucial point in a boy's life. We've been told all sorts of shit and getting, the, you know, just getting demeanor of how you're supposed to deal with a threat or aggression or something. And it's like, he's taking... It's not so much what the teacher's saying in words. They're taking cues and bodily cues, and it goes all the way down to pheromones. So it's like this is so fucked up. It's it's. I I'm just I'm just amazed our our culture is more fucked up than it, than it is. But uh, yeah, so so in uh, we 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 should be putting kids um, in. Uh, well, allowing kids to explore, but actually having a uh, normal um, setting for them to, to discover, you know, what, what gender role they actually, you know, settle down in. Um, but anyway, yeah. Next week, continue this or? Yeah, sure. Okay, should we carry on next week? Yes. I think people have been, um, because of the interview with Lear, we've been uh, glued <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> for yeah. Uh, three hours, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, too long. All right. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I think it's an important conversation to have because um, I have, like, uh, tra internet trans friends, and I don't know how to uh, talk to them about this without getting, you know, my head chopped off, so... Yeah, it's a religious war now. You can't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. I think, can I just say something? I think um, people should focus on their personalities instead of what what they look like. Like, so they look, you know, so they're male, and they feel like they're female. So, so big deal. Or well, you're female, yeah, yeah. And you feel like you're male. So, big deal. So, does it make you any better? Than me and doesn't make me better than you. It just makes you a human being. So what? <laughs> well, the thing is not to is to the transformation is a transformation from ego. So it it's 
the really dangerous thing is we're getting into all these ego identification. So they're not working and they're being reinforced and they're getting to the stage where they're being manipulated by psyops and you know political entities and it's basically we've, we've gone way too far in in this culture um you know for it's considering we're just chimps it's it's just abuse from every every angle but the the only way out is is to stop ego identification to to try and transcend the ego. So we've got a choice. We can either go back to hunter-gatherers and then you you return to tribal life and try and restore those, which people try and do by going off-grid and it never works. Or you can forge ahead to the shamanic transformation, which means you get over your ego. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're we're about to now. Yeah. Are you wrapping up? Or? That's it. Yeah, no, yeah. Finish. Thank you very I like, much. I like the conclusion. Good night, everybody. Happy Ashtar. 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 Happy